Wong. Um, and Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Sarah. Um, I use she, they pronouns, and I am the community programs coordinator for All Brain Salon. And I think um, most of you have been to a brain club before, but um, this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, so this is part of our community education series. This brain club, we're actually going to spend most of it watching Dr. Melissa Hauser give a talk um, to a lot of CVMC, Central Park Medical Center's um, medical staff. And her talk is really focused on cultural competency with neurodivergence um, and um, geared towards a medical audience. Um, and I'm sorry, my voice is a little bit gone. I'm recovering from um, COVID this week. Our household got it. Um, so let me know if you can't hear me at all. Um, but I was just going to start off um, with a few slides, just kind of introducing some of the topics that Mel is going to be talking about. Um, and then at 6.15, um, Orca Media, with their magical ways, is going to stream Mel's talk from um, Microsoft Teams to Zoom. So we'll be able to watch it during the presentation. If you have anything you want to ask, um, ask Dr. Hauser or us or anything, feel free to put it in the chat. We won't have video into Microsoft Teams or uh, sorry, we won't have audio into Microsoft Teams. Um, but if you put it in the chat, then we can talk about it after she's done with her presentation. Um, awesome. Can you guys see the slides that I have up? Okay, perfect. Um, awesome. So um, most of this topic and most of kind of what we wanted um, you guys to get out of this topic was communicating your access needs in healthcare. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, we are Auburn's Belong. Um, we are a neuroinclusive healthcare and community center in Montpelier. Um, and just some ground rules for Brain Club and for any of our Zoom meetings, all forms of participation are okay. So video on or off is fine. There's no expectation for you to make eye contact, smile, anything like that. Um, and walk, feel free to walk around, move, fidget, take snacks, take breaks. Um, kids, animals, whatever's coming in, that's totally fine. Um, any type of communication is okay. So speak, type in the chat box, gesture emoticons, reactions, mix and match of everything. Um, again, during Mel's presentation, we won't have audio in. So if you can ask questions in the chat box and then we can talk about it after, or you can just save your questions and speak it after. Um, and then safety come first. So we affirm all aspects of identity here um, and we respect and protect one's access needs. Um, so on this note, um, a lot of times when we're talking about these things, we're talking about a lot of healthcare trauma. So we're talking about a lot of traumatizing experience. Um, and so if you're talking about something that was traumatizing to you or you experienced as traumatic, just let others know so they can listen if they want or um, not listen if they don't want. Um, so there's a little content warning and then giving 30 seconds or so for people to jump out or mute if they want. Um, and then, we are able to do closed captionings, I believe. Um, and this is how you can do it. Um, at the bottom of the screen, there should be a live transcript, which I'm actually not seeing. Um, let's see if I can see it. Are you getting closed captionings? Or was getting, that a thumbs up? Yeah, I'm getting messages okay, perfect. that it's requested, so I said yes. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so the agenda for tonight, um, we're going to start for the next 10 minutes or so talking about um, communicating your access needs in a healthcare setting, um, and then live presentations from Central Mount Medical Center um, about neuroinclusive healthcare to an audience of healthcare providers. So what is an access need? 
Um, sorry, I'm not sure what these, I don't know if other people can see these green lines, but that's what they are, but that's okay. Um, so what does an access need? An access need is anything required for somebody to meaningfully and fully participate in one's environment and community. So everyone has access needs. Um, some people's access needs are easily accepted and easily available. Some people's aren't. <clears throat> We can see the whole Sarah, do we want to record this or do you think we're good with Orca? Thank you, Sarah. I will record it. Yeah, no problem. I am going to. Sarah, I have a question. Yeah. Can I, can I turn off the closed captioning? You should be able to. Yeah. Um, if you click on the um, live transcript button at the bottom, I have an option to hide subtitles. Okay. There it is. Uh, it sometimes depends on what version of Zoom that you're using, um, where the option is, but usually it's the live transcript button. Oh, well. um, okay. I'll look. I'll look around. Um, okay, so access needs. Um, so access needs are anything required for anybody to meaningfully um, fully participate. We oftentimes think of access needs as accommodations kids get in school or people need at work, but access needs are really in every part of our life, whether we're talking about healthcare, whether we're talking about relationships, whether we're talking about accessing a grocery store, um, anything. And everybody has access needs, no matter if they are neurotypical or neurodivergent or anywhere in between. Um, so here's some examples of access needs. Um, so we have physical access needs. So environment, mobility, or sensory. So things like wheelchair ramps, um, seating options, or sensory needs. So needing different types of sensory seats to sit in in a waiting room, for example. Um, there can be emotional access needs, people either needing to be able to share certain emotions with each other, people needing to protect themselves from other people's emotions. Um, communication access needs is one we see very often. So um, how information is given, how we're expected to process it in terms of processing time and speed. Um, and then other so interpersonal and social access needs. Um, which comes up a lot in relationships, which we've talked about in past brain clubs, about how hard it is to have conflicting access needs in relationships, whether we're talking about parent-child or whether we're talking about romantic relationships or whatever. Um, technological access needs. So whether we're using technology to meet an access need or an access need is, I can't stare at a screen all day, any of those. Um, and then allergies, other medical access needs. Um, which can be really kind of big and far between. Um, does anyone have um, examples of access needs um, that they frequently ask in their everyday life? Um, I often, uh, depending on the situation, of course, but I often ask people to text me rather than email. Mm -hmm. That's a really important one for a lot of people. I it's hate Ashley email. Pooch oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I am deaf in my right ear. And so I often mm. have to ask to reposition folks either in a room or in a walking capacity to be on the right side in order to be able to hear. That's a really great example of one. I can say one that I use a lot is um, needing to be able to have something to fidget with, whether that's um, somebody giving me something to fidget with or just being allowed to use one of my own fidgets in a space. Um, that's a common one for me. Um, so if we're thinking about access needs um, in terms of the healthcare setting, so communicating what your access needs are to healthcare providers, whether we're talking about if you are 
a patient in the hospital, a primary, a patient in the like primary care specialist office, um, or if you're doing any other type of medical setting, are there certain things that you feel like you um, have been able to ask for access needs, have been easy to ask for? Are there certain things that have been hard to ask for? I'd love to just hear anybody's experiences of access needs and specifically in healthcare. I think, um, well, one of my access needs, and I just really came to it recently, um, was um, being comfortable with asking questions and challenging and challenging the doctor's opinions. Um, that's been huge for me. Um, stopping a procedure that was painful. Um, mm. you know, um, I guess participating <laughs> um, and making it patient-centered instead of physician-centered. Absolutely. Yeah, for me, it was the, the thing that's really key is being able to write out and send early in um, what I'm going to talk about because um, mm -hmm. it gives me time to gather my thoughts. It helps a lot. That's a really good one. And then in the chat, we have um, Emily saying, I can't be in heat because of pots. So I asked to meet people indoors or in shade on a cool day. That's a really great example. And I asked to have a support person with me so I could have um, help communicating with people I'm uncomfortable with. Um, this is one of the only asks that is usually accepted. Absolutely. Yeah, I think one thing that we see a lot with um, healthcare settings is that there's certain access needs like bringing a support person like physical access needs in terms of mobility wheelchair ramps and that type of stuff interpreter services there's certain ones that healthcare settings are used to and do day in and day out um and then they often don't accept any other ones or aren't kind of willing to discuss other ones um again that's not every healthcare setting um but similar to kind of any setting, it's brain rules of the world that, oh, everybody should be able to come and sit outside on a nice sunny day. Everybody should be able to um, communicate what's been happening with their health day of in the visit during that stressful time and not write it out first. Um, and that's not totally feasible for everybody. The... Um... The team that was working on me, uh, that I was in, and I was in too much pain, um, they were so confused <laughs> when I told them to stop. <laughs> they were, it was, I said, step away from my body. <laughs> and, and they said, what? And I said, step away from my body. And they said, well, we've got a schedule to keep. And I said, well, I don't. <laughs> So. I think that's a really good point, Matt, that like in healthcare settings, you always have a say in what's happening to your body and having that like stop and step away from my body. I think that's a really great, um, that's a really great script to use to like actually get people to like stop and take you seriously. I wonder if anybody else has scripts that they've used or other ways that they've been able to get access needs met in settings, um, specifically healthcare settings or any tips and tricks for other people who may be having a hard time asking for those. I see in the chat, creating collaborative settings, having deadlines to help to share work and communicate effectively. I think that's a really good one, Jose. Um, and Sarah said, um, in response to Matt, I learned how to do that in childbirth as well, advocating access needs very clearly, absolutely. Um, and that's something we talk about in childbirth, having a birthing plan and having a plan of what you want before going in. And then also having like backup plans and contingency plans as like, what if this doesn't work? Um, and it's, it's something we talk about with childbirth and not much else, not any other procedures. Um, and yeah, I'm whether that's, I, I'm not sure why that is specifically, um, but I think that's a really good point, Sarah, that um, that's somewhere that people I think are a little bit more comfortable or at least 
maybe not more comfortable, but more used to advocating their access needs. Laura in the chat says, in childbirth, we also talk about having a doula or support person who is fully informed about your birth plan, who can help, help advocate for you if you become unable to communicate your own needs. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I certainly see that in, um, I, I worked in hospice for a long time, and I certainly see that in hospice and people talking about the ways they want the kind of end of their life to go, whether we're talking about um, uh, um, advanced directives or kind of whatever, having that plan ahead of time. Um, and that can be really helpful for lots of places. And Sarah in the chat says, I think sometimes we get great practicing communication access needs on behalf of our children then we can turn around and apply it to ourselves. Absolutely, I think it's a really good point, Sarah. Um, I think we talk day in and day out about access needs in school and kids being able to have um, fidget chairs and kids being able to take breaks. And um, I know I live next to a middle school and it's very common for breaks to be walk around the block um, and seeing kids walk around my house because they need that break, they need that time to have some physical sensory input. Um, and we talk about that with kids all the time. And then we forget that these kids grow into adults and have the same access needs often. Um, this is, this is um, inspired me at some point when I, when I get a minute to create um, a plan and communicate it to my doctor for the next time my shunt fails uh, mm. to the neurosurgeons up in, at UVM, because when I, uh, by the time I realize something is wrong, um, I'm on my way to dying. So it's always termed an emergency and I get transported to the hospital and um, it would be so helpful because I know the medications I react poorly to. Um, mm -hmm. I know medications I prefer. I know medications I need, um, all these different things um, and preferences and all these things. And I can I can write them down and, and create my own shunt failure plan. I really love that idea, Matt. I think having, having those things written out, especially if you have a chronic illness where you know that there are likely going to be times when this thing happens again. Um, Mia, you've got your hand raised. Do you want to unmute and try? And we may be cut off at some point to listen to Mel's presentation. But we're yeah. yeah, well, you know, one of the things that I have... Um, anxiety about and I've never needed hospital treatment like for many years but uh, as someone with issues with my body I'm a trans woman autistic trans woman and uh, basically there's this um, like they've like I'm okay to undress in terms of medical for medical context in a medical context but there have been cases where they, they've spoken about bringing um, body cameras in for clinical sat like nurses. And I find myself wondering, will they have, uh, will they have them in, uh, in treatment rooms? And I've heard mm. paramedics also. And there's this, I feel there's this culture where basically they say that it's to tackle violence. And it feels like there's this culture that if you ask questions about it or if you oppose these measures, then you're against um, then you're against safety for staff, and that's not the case. And it's like I'm afraid to to ask questions for fear of being accused of things like of not caring, and and yet at the same time, it might prevent me from going to the um, uh, hospital or or calling an ambulance, it might deter me. And like, what people don't get is that it's dangerous putting people in that position, like where they're, they're unsure about. And yeah, I guess sort of it would be, I'd like to get to a space where, where, um, where sort of it's safe for people to, to ask questions and and when they do, they'll be listened to. 
I think that's a really great point. And thanks for sharing, Mia. I think that um, it's uh, healthcare settings are really hard to ask those questions. And I think a lot of it is because of that. There's that inherent kind of hierarchy. There's that inherent power difference between a provider or a healthcare worker and a patient. Um, and especially when people aren't used to people communicating for their access needs, um, you can be met with a lot of pushback, absolutely. Um, and Laura says in the chat, as a nurse who has been assaulted many times in many different ways, this is a huge issue of conflicting access needs. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a, um, yeah, there's access needs of the healthcare providers as well. We talked about the kind of conflicting access needs. There's access needs of the people who are um, working, the people who you're trying to communicate your access needs to as well. Mm. Promoting, you you know, kind of... oh, it looks like we've got. Yep. Okay, great. All right. Let me just ask because I forgot how in in Teams I can't see you when I'm in my own screen. Um, has Orca Media rejoined the participants? Yes, they have. Oh, perfect. All right. Here we go. Recording in progress. All right, now I really can't see you for real because now I'm in full screen mode. So like just unmute if you want to get my attention. All right, so um, again, I'm really excited to be here with so many people I haven't seen in such a long time. Um, and uh, as Chris said, we're going to be talking about neuroinclusive healthcare tonight. And while I have no financial disclosures, I'm first gonna tell you about something super cool before we start. Um, so thanks to a partnership with Orca Media, which is a nonprofit organization in Montpelier um, that uses super fancy, amazing telecommunications technology um, to promote community engagement. Um, right now, my organization, All Brains Belong, um, is holding our weekly community education program called Brain Club. And uh, thanks to Orca Media, we are now joined by um, Brain Club participants, which is a group of community members, patients, um, some interdisciplinary healthcare providers that, are, that, 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 that gather week to week um, talking about everyday brain life things. And so thank you to, to Chris and Christine and Alicia uh, for, for collaborating to make this super cool thing possible where, where we have one way live stream of this presentation to Brain Club. So hello, Brain Club participants. Um, what we've been talking about um, at some of our community education programs um, is something called the double empathy problem. And the double empathy problem, uh, which was first named by an autistic social scientist in the UK named Dr. Damien Milton, talks about how rather than think about um, one normal, uh, 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 correct way of communicating, um, in, in, in research studies or, or, or repeatedly over the past 10 years, it's been shown that when um, autistic people speak to one another, communicate uh, to one another, um, that communication is uh, efficient and um, uh, not particularly uh, error prone, um, uh, just as uh, neurotypical participants, um, again, efficient communication. But in both directions, um, there are communication breakdowns um, when people have a mismatch of worldview and communication style. So often what we do at our Brain Club series is we talk about bridging the double entity problem. So, um, and we talk about that in all different settings, um, in, in relationships, uh, romantic relationships, family relationships, um, employment relationships, and um, here, what we will be talking about as we think about um, the, the, the healthcare relationships that, that we all are in um, with autistic or otherwise neurodivergent patients, often the double empathy problem is um, a framework for understanding sometimes when it does not go well. And what I, what I will share about that is that, you know, having trained and practiced, um, you know, for, for the past decade in, in the system, like the same system that, that, that 
most of you all trained in, you know, I've had to, I, 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 I definitely um, did not intuitively have neurocultural competence. And in fact, it was not until my experience as a parent um, that first um, prompted me to recognize that, to recognize the limitations of my training um, and the way I saw the world as a doctor. Because um, there I am on the left. I remember it was uh, it, that picture was taken shortly after I started, uh, you know, working at CVMC and met many of you for the first time. There I was, like a week before I gave birth to Luna. There's um, and and you know, here I was. Doctor takes care of patients. Thought I would knew what I was doing. Um, but then you know, there's Luna on the right, and uh, Luna made it clear in no uncertain terms that the framework of my medical training, the framework of my thinking as a human were like fundamentally inadequate to meet her needs. And she made it clear in no uncertain terms that it was the environment um, that was causing trouble. The world was too bright, too loud, moved way too fast. Um, and uh, the environment was getting in the way of Luna being her best little baby self. That's Luna now. Luna is the world's wisest five-year-old. And Luna has taught me so much um, and has made me a, uh, a better human and certainly a better doctor. So, oops, sorry. So um, as Chris said, what I do now is I, not exclusively, but um, uh, the, the overwhelming majority of my patients are neurodivergent kids and adults, often multi-generational families. And we'll talk about what that, what that looks like. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about my nonprofit organization at the end. So what we're really talking about is that one in five people learns, thinks, and or communicates differently than the so-called typical brain. Even though I'm not really sure there is a typical brain. Um, you know, we all exist on this continuum of in the infinite number of ways in which uh, brains, brains work. We all exist on a, on, a, on a big continuum. But if we're really thinking about one in five brains that substantially departs from um, the uh, the majority of brains, or the uh, the way of doing things that has been um, you know uh, normed as the uh, most desirable way of doing things by um, you know like this society in this day and time. So we're going to talk about how um, those one in five people, unfortunately in a lot of instances, do not get very good health care. And we're going to look at some of the outcomes and the reasons for that. Um, and I, I started referring to this as uh, neurocultural competency, because um, just like other uh, forms of cultural competency, um, there's like things that we can do by better understanding um, uh, this lens, um, because this, 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 I think can bridge that gap for the healthcare outcomes, the health inequities that I will soon tell you about. We'll look at the specific uh, systemic barriers to healthcare access for neurodivergent patients um, in, 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 and really uh, take a look at the social model of disability where just as I was saying that Luna's environment was a mismatch for her needs, so it is for so many of our patients. And we'll look at some uh, concrete specific actionable steps that Hopefully, um, you can you can just start implementing wherever you are in all the many settings that you practice in. So, um, cultural competency. So, um, you know, when uh, as as uh, I'm sure most of us have have received all kinds of cultural competency training in our careers, but um, the uh, for 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 those the, those joining us. Um, um, at Brain Club, I'll, I'll just I include this, that the American Hospital Association defines cultural competency as the ability to provide care to patients of diverse values, beliefs, and behaviors, and tailoring to meet um, patients' needs. And this uh, plays out in um, uh, healthcare provider behaviors, attitudes, policies, everything. And when we look at um, approaches to reducing health disparities, um, Cultural competency is an important step. 
So I'm going to, before I, I get into some, uh, we're going to look at the current state of affairs uh, for neurodivergent health. Um, I'm going to play a quick video clip. I hope this works. Um, this is uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Lovins, who is an, an internist uh, hospitalist um, on faculty at Dartmouth um, that I'm a uh, member of my board of directors at All Brains Belong. And uh, this this recording comes from a previous brain club about uh, what 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 her experience was when she first started learning about these issues after, you know, having, you know, been in practice for like three decades and having never, never heard about this before. Let me know if this, if you can't hear this or if it's in some way not working. Well, I don't, this is something I think about all the time when we talk because I, because I have learned so much from you, so much. And, um, yeah, so just to get that part out, I think that learning about this, learning about, about neurodiversity as a grown-up physician that's been practicing for a long time, or just as a person, really more as a person, to, to, to change my perspective so that I can identify different patterns and see it less as oh my god this person is, is driving me crazy because they're not like me but like this person's brain works differently than me and that has many benefits and and it causes me frustration but if i can understand it better then i can then two things happen i get much less frustrated i also learn what how to appreciate i, I learn what i'm getting from this other person whose brain is different from me i'm much more patient and you know, just aids in communication, which is, you know, communication is sort of everything in the universe. Like in my mind, communication is all things. Oh, it is. Yeah. So, without further ado, we'll get into our part one. So, let's talk about the current state of affairs for neurodivergent health otherwise known as what I didn't learn in medical training. So autistic adults, and of course, um, uh, neurodivergency is a broader umbrella, but we'll take a look at autism uh, to start. Autistic adults have poor access to healthcare. So in a study of um, uh, over a thousand autistic adults who had established primary care relationships, 80% almost had difficulty accessing primary care. Almost 70% um, uh, reported untreated uh, physical and mental health conditions. Um, this is in a, in a, in a study of uh, Medicaid claims, uh, looking at four to five times the outpatient cost, six times the emergency department cost, twice prescription drug use. And um, despite 73% of autistic adults in this study reporting that it was important to them to have a good relationship with a PCP, only about a third actually did. And in fact, um, almost 40% don't even tell their PCP that they're autistic, specifically because they are fear of judgment. And not surprisingly, um, autistic adults have lower access to preventive care. Um, Darty et al, um, uh, re really helpful study that greatly informed the design of my current practice, um, looked at extensive barriers to care and broke it down into three buckets, um, the environment and uh, healthcare interactions, which includes um, uh, sensory processing aspects in the environment, light, the ticking clock, like all these things and specific communication um, challenges within the healthcare environment. Looking at the system where there's, you know, there's so, in, in society, right, there's so many things that are offered in the default way, you know, um, and, 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 you know, it's not just healthcare, but if you look at healthcare, you know, there's a lot of defaults in healthcare um, where, you know, you must pick up the phone to make an appointment. You must fill out the 20 page packet to become a new patient. You know, and, and any time you have a default and someone's brain doesn't, uh, that it doesn't do it in that way, um, by, de by, by default, <laughs> they, they're going to feel othered. Um, and so while we, you know, we certainly um, 
uh, being able to offer accommodations is 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 great. We want to be able to do that, but um, there's still going to be others because they weren't able to access it in the default way. So um, there's also the element of you know we talk about the hidden curriculum in medical education, right? Like I remember um, even as a as a medical student. I remember things like, you know, my attendings would comment like, oh, well, you know, they say they've got 10 out of 10 pain, but they've got the positive cell phone sign, you know, as though if someone's able to use a cell phone, they're not in pain. Or like, um, you know, just kind of thinking about that there's one default way that someone might present and that that means something. Um, but what I thought really interesting about this study was that autistic adult patients describe specifically um, that they're perceiving that their healthcare providers have insufficient knowledge and insufficient skills to take care of them, and particularly unhelpful attitudes that they are able to pick up from their healthcare providers. And this was, um, th th well, while, while this study was looking at um, primary care experiences specifically, um, I, 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 I would hypothesize that, that, that um, what, what is described here plays out in, in all different types of healthcare interactions. But that's still not why we're talking about this. We're talking about this because autistic patients are dying. The average life expectancy for an autistic adult, 36 to 54 years. When I learned that, I quit my job, started my nonprofit organization, and I was mortified that I didn't know that. So I'm gonna give a content warning for suicide, and just if if, um, if anyone, um, I just want everyone to be able to listen to this in uh, with with informed consent. Um, and I'll I'll, uh, I'll 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 just ask that um, my staff um, type into the chat box when when I'm done after my next slide. The leading causes of death for autistic people are premature cardiovascular disease and suicide. We're gonna come back to the cardiovascular disease component um, in uh, later on in the talk, but specific as it relates to suicide, autistic adults have four to nine times increased risk of suicide um, with almost seven, you know, 72% of autistic adults um, having had a history of uh, suicidal ideation. And then depending on, you know, a variety of, wide range of, um, of, 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 of studies looking at this, anywhere from a seven to 47% um, attempting suicide. And interestingly, the suicide risk is higher, completed suicide risk is higher in those with lower support needs, um, with uh, research further identifying that pressure to camouflage or mask in some way not be not not, uh, not be able to um, show up as one's true self is independently associated with an increased risk of completed suicide. Forcing to comply with the default, the messages explicitly and implicitly that there's one correct way of being a person. End of content warning. What I learned about about autism in medical school. Um, I had a one hour lecture focusing on the triad of impairments and a rote list of co-occurring conditions. And with uh, out, out, out in my clerkships and certainly out in residency, my developmental pediatrics training, you know, really limited the stereotypes with an emphasis on red flags and prevention, an emphasis on treating behaviors. And I had the idea that this was rare. You know, you're either autistic or you're not. And that, that this was, you know, not very common. And um, as I said before, um, when, um, when, 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 when a person, you know, even a, even a, even a little kid, uh, receives the message that there is one correct, right way to develop, to play, to learn, to otherwise be a human, that stigma has a profound impact. And what I didn't learn in medical school was this. I didn't learn um, anything about the way that narrative was constructed. 
when we look at the way that um, uh, in 1943, uh, a description of, of lack of social interest, obsessive insistence on sameness, and when you follow that through um, the, the, the historical chain here, um, that is not that different really um, from, from how even in DSM-5, um, those stereotypes are really still illustrated. Um, and um, when we think about um, in the 1960s and 70s with Ivar Lovas first developing applied behavioral analysis, um, that is still the uh, go-to mainstream treatment for sweet little loves um, in 2022. Ivar Lovas, I might also mention, is the developer of uh, gay conversion therapy. In 2022, this uh, comes, uh, this is uh, shared um, with permission from a family. Um, this is written by um, an evaluator in 2022, that the seven-year-old does not come across as clinically having the separate inwardly focused quality pathognomonic of the disorder. He interacts significantly and seamlessly with parents and demonstrates empathy. Rapport is present. Ergo, he is not autistic. So when you're only trained in stereotypes, um, not surprising that um, uh, Zerbo et al. in 2015, it's fascinating uh, study up at, at, at Kaiser, that less than 10% of primary care physicians would suspect autism if the patient volunteers information, shows interest in people, discusses emotions, and can see the whole picture. So here's what uh, one, of, one of my patients would like to share. Hello, my name is Megan and I am autistic. I know what you're probably thinking. Uh, you don't really look autistic. You're speaking to me, you're making eye contact, we're having a conversation, you're definitely not autistic. And probably about five months ago, I would have agreed with you. Um, I just recently got my autism and my ADHD diagnosis back in January of this year. And since then, my entire life has changed, to be honest. Um, Prior to this, I didn't realize that a lot of the, the struggles I was having in my day-to-day -day life were pretty much all connected to autism, and nobody had screamed me for autism. Nobody had ever indicated that I might be autistic. Um, but when I thought of someone who was autistic, I thought of like a nonverbal young boy who, you know, was kind of just lost in his own head, um, not super connected to his surroundings. And that is one way that autism can present. Yes, however. Autism is not a linear spectrum. Um, there are many different facets of your life that it can impact from motor skills to executive functioning, the language to social skills, um, to interoception, literally every aspect of your life. Um, since having learned that I'm autistic, my life makes so much more sense. Um, a lot of the, the behaviors that I had as a child and continuing up into adulthood um, the way I proceed and move through the world, they are all impacted by autism. Um, how much energy I exert in social interactions and masking, um, all the internalized ableism um, that I am working so hard now to try to dismantle. Um, I'm a late diagnosed autistic. I got my diagnosis at 31 years old. Um, so all of the, the coping mechanisms and the skills they built up to, to mask my autistic traits, um, I'm now having to unlearn. I feel like it's very, very important for providers um, to please be aware that uh, autism looks different for everybody. It's again, um, try broaching some of these conversations and having more conversations about neurodivergency. Um, there are so many more people in your life who are neurodivergent than you probably realize. All right, thank you so much. Take care, guys. All right. So, thing is, that's not all we're missing. 
we're seeing these folks. Um, and, um, you know, if, if certainly if we, if we know that we are taking care of an autistic patient, we may know about the things that are associated with autism, but, but that's not how the people come in. They come in with their, with, 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 with their medical problems. Um, this slide is intentionally busy um, and, and we'll get into some of this, um, but you know, if you know that your patient's autistic and you may know that these, you know, things like obstructive sleep apnea, autonomic dysfunction, hypermobility, you may know that some of these things are associated with autism, but they don't, they, they, they don't, they don't, they don't come in. They come in with, um, you know, all of the medically undifferentiated symptoms. They come in with their chronic allergies, their um, uh, multi-organ immune system stuff. They come in with their sleep stuff. They come in with their GI stuff, their nervous system stuff, their connective tissue stuff, their vitamin absorption stuff, their face, dental, jaw stuff. And when you zoom way out, the nervous system goes everywhere. And since everything's connected to everything, uh, it's one of my, I, I included this, one of my patients came up with this. That was so fascinating. Um, if you pull the wrong string, you can make the knot tighter like a ball of yarn. So um, when uh, this, this is, we did some internal quality improvement stuff in my practice. Um, we, uh, this is, we've got about a, a hundred more people in the practice um, than when we did this uh, last, but of our first 140 patients, 70% had this cluster. Um, and this was stuff I didn't know about. I didn't, I didn't know that neurodivergent people had this predictive pattern of anatomical airway differences. I didn't know that for the, the, those who describe transient brain fog, it's actually correlated with like objective relative, like 93% of a young, healthy person, 20s. Um, and that standard management of some of the components of this cluster worsens the others. You know, uh, people with chronic pain on a muscle relaxant, turns out it's making their floppy connective tissue and their airway floppier. Um, when a dopamine bound brain ends up on an antipsychotic, that doesn't work out very well. Uh, when someone is, um, you know, uh, doing some, some compression therapy for their, their dysautonomia or their hypermobility, if they also have blood flow differences, worsen their ischemia. So, Patients, um, you know, the experience of the patients in this community are that having a unified narrative to understand their health, that they don't have 45 different things, quote, wrong, has made a profound difference in their lives. And in fact, if you're interested, uh, we have an, uh, my nonprofit organization, All Brains Belong, has a, has a task force. We, 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 we sometimes refer to this um, autoimmune uh, multi-organ system cluster as all the things because all the patients here have all the things, um, where once a month we have an interprofessional collaboration of clinicians, researchers, patients who come and talk through best practices and contraindications. And I'd love, love for you to join. Um, and in fact, um, in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Laura Lewis at UVM, um, we are, we have a, an, a community research project. And in particular, when I think about um, number, number three um, in the developing of a management support tool for primary care, um, I, I, we, we, we would, would love, love to collaborate um, with folks of all specialties to talk through these different parts of how, the, of, of, of how this plays out um, for autistic physiology. Um, so please reach out if, if you're interested. Um, and for uh, next, I'm gonna to shift to part two of this talk on the lens and language of neurocultural competency. So um, as, I, as I said before, 
Um, you know, we, we, we really all exist on this continuum because we all have different brains with different ways of sensing, processing, thinking, communicating, learning all the things. Um, and, and, and we all have unique patterns of strengths and challenges. You know, when we think about the, um, you know, the, the DSM-5 diagnostics um, for, for, for autism, for example, really those are, those are autistic dysregulation behaviors. That is when, um, when, when, when a, a, a nervous system becomes so dysregulated, we may see these more um, extreme presentations. Um, but in day-to-day -day life, it's really just we all do things differently. And I like this. I like this cartoon. I use this a lot with kids, but I think it's helpful for adults too. Um, with with thinking about how like we all have different phones, right? You don't try to have the iPhone run the Samsung apps. It's not gonna work very well. Just do it differently. Um, or uh, my 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 colleague Sierra Miller um, uh, talks about having like a a Mac brain like running a, in a in a in a PC world. So, you know, when we think about, you know, yeah, yeah, for sure, there, there are impairments, sure, real impairments. When we think about disability, um, disability is on a, uh, is, is relative, you know, rather than the medical model where it's all about uh, de deficiencies within the individual. Um, the, the World Health Organization for the past 20 years has defined disability according to the social model where, you um, uh, depending on the barriers to access for meaningful participation in the world, um, a person is going to have more or less disability. So if I'm a wheelchair user um, and I approach a building that has a ramp, I'm going to have less disability than if I approach a building that does not have a ramp. And when it comes to invisible disabilities, um, it, 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 it may not be as clear um, as in that example with the ramp, um, but this is how it's playing out all the day. Um, so lens and language count as barriers to access and inclusion. So when we think about some of the terms um, that are commonly used within the healthcare system, um, the neurodivergent community, um, uh, met many, many members of the neurodivergent community find these terms triggering and offensive. And um, in fact, you've uh, heard me refer several times using identity first, autistic person, um, uh, despite the way I was trained in my, in, in, in my medical training. Um, and it's because that for the majority of autistic adults, um, autism is experienced as an important part of identity. So when people get the message, both directly and indirectly, that their way of thinking, behaving, communicating is fundamentally wrong, broken, and needs changing or fixing, that has a profound impact on their interactions in the world. And when we think about um, nervous system regulation and borrowing this model from the, the book, The Whole Brain Child by Dr. Dan Siegel, Dr. Tina Pay Bryson, um, upstairs brain and downstairs brain. When downstairs brain is triggered by day-to-day -day interactions within the healthcare system, interactions with us, not going to be able to have full access to upstairs brain. And what we may see this playing out, we might see, you know, overt fight or flight behaviors, but we might see something else. This regulation can present so much more broadly than that. Present as profound fatigue, flood of ideas, excessive people pleasing, blazing over, or I don't know. And when we think about sensory processing, in addition to you know the five senses that um, you know we may we, we may think about, we then we have the other four senses: proprioception, vestibular, interoception, the sensation of internal body signals. The one that I think um, that that you know I didn't know anything about um, and, and, and until recently was neuroception threat detection. Um, all of us are uh, monitoring the, the environment, safe, not safe. 
And um, when someone is wired such to be more sensitive to threat, whether that is, is, is just how, how, how they're wired or acquired trauma physiology, it's going to have a profound impact on, on, on interactions. So when we think about um, environmental things within healthcare system that may be, because again, those, um, I'll go back for a second. Um, these sensory systems are not separate. They all interact. And um, we all, we, we all differ in our sensory processing. And that may, it's not just going to differ person to person, but it may differ within a single person over, over a lifetime or even just context dependent. You know, if, um, you know, a, a, if I have, uh, I've eaten, I'm well rested, I drink water, and someone's like clicking their pen, um, you know, I'll hear them, but I, I may not like totally flip my lid. Um, if I have not met my other physiologic needs, you know, that sound may sound like somebody stabbing me in the brain with a screwdriver, because all these senses interact. And when we think about how this plays out for patients in our environments, whether that be in an inpatient setting or outpatient, light, sound, temperature, the smells, the opportunities for movement. Um, if you have the kind of brain that actually uh, processes auditory information better when moving, um, and the default is to sit in the chair, um, you know, for however long the appointment is, well, maybe that person didn't necessarily encode anything we said. Maybe um, the, the specifics of how that communication is going is also playing out um, in a way that is not meeting the person's needs. You know, I remember in medical school, we were trained, you know, open-ended questions. That's the way you do it. Um, well, um, there, there are some brains that um, neuroceptive system says no. Um, you know, this, 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 this we're, we're turning questions of any kind into statements, um, sometimes yields more information. Um, providing choices, menus, um, providing multiple different ways to provide information. Maybe it's the pre-visit planning process. Um, maybe it's to be able to write stuff ahead of time and, and show up, even though, you know, uh, when I, uh, harken back to what I said about the hidden curriculum, I remember being, you know, I'd have, um, I'd have attendings, you know, refer, or actually mo mostly it was like uh, 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 dysregulated residents would comment about the patient with the list as though that meant something as opposed to this is a person who organizes information and writing. I think about processing time visual supports to anchor attention, um, and, and having, you know, as I said before, a, uh, options for communicating asynchronously, whether that being able to, um, you know, uh, uh, send emails or, um, or, or, or in some way pre-visit planning uh, that's not during, you know, that 15-minute that, that encounter or the, you know, the 15 minutes on rounds. Um, so when we think about executive functioning, these like high level cortical functions, right? Like this, you can you can think about how you know, how this how how everything everything in daily life uh, relies heavily on these, and so um, this impacts everything in healthcare interactions. You think about patients with frequently missed appointments, um, people you know not following through with recommendations, uh, medication errors, the perception of time. Like uh, I, I, I uh, think about like, you know, the, the, uh, someone who, um, uh, you know, a, a conversation that seems to be going on forever. Well, there are lots of brains who don't perceive time in the same way um, and really uh, uh, are, are very much supported by external executive functioning supports for the passing of time. And um, I, I, I can't uh, not include this. Um, neurodivergent people are at higher risk of long COVID, which, um, which, which relates to the, uh, the, the autoimmune picture that I mentioned before. Um, you know, long, long COVID is, is, is all the things kicked off by COVID. 
Um, and so, as I said earlier, you know, 70% of our medical practice has long COVID or long COVID like autoimmune symptoms. It's like a lot of people. Um, this is, I didn't know this is how I was going to be spending my whole day, but this is how I spend my whole day. So, um, as, and I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions, um, but look at this, reimagining what's possible. Um, I found myself last year wondering, you know, because uh, I then had a, 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 a four-year-old um, and my four-year-old had, has grown up in a neurodiversity affirming household. And um, she's always been taught that some brains do this, some brains do that. And like, there's not a right brain. And so, you know, we just, we talk about our brains a lot in this house. By we, I mean, me and now her. Um, I don't know that my husband talks about brains very much, um, but um, I, what could be possible if all kids grew up that way? Because inclusion begins in toddlerhood, preschool the latest. As I said before, any time there is a default, everything else is othered. So therefore, anytime there's a default, there's no inclusion because inclusion is perceived belonging. And if you feel like other, you're not gonna feel like you belong. So, um, what we do here at All Brains Belong isn't very complicated. We just ask people what they need and we're small enough to be able to do what they say. And um, starting with um, literature on the big picture, some of which I've shared today, um, of what the broader population is looking for, we designed our little system. And when I really think about how I was spending my time in a traditional healthcare setting, um, so much of it was helping people problem solve school, employment, how to make friends, how to deal with um, the systemic ableism or the widespread belief that it is superior to be able to do the thing than not. Really to do anything for the neurodivergent community, we have to do everything because it's everything where this plays out. We began um, with a community forum, bringing, bringing folks together and asking them what inclusion meant to them. And then we did it. So um, All Brains Belong um, offers not only healthcare, um, but uh, educational and social connection opportunities where we try not to have any defaults, where it's really thinking about connection as the pathway to health. And um, as I said, trying to not have defaults, um, all patients, not just those who disclose any certain diagnoses or any particular disabilities, everybody gets a customized menu where they have multiple different ways to schedule appointments, to communicate with us during and between appointments, um, sensory and executive functioning supports, um, and if they if they choose to um, to be to 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 have integration into our community programs. Um, one of uh, the community programs, uh, community health programs that, that, that we've done, we've done this four times since, since the winter, including a couple weeks ago on the State House lawn, we're doing again on the 24th of September, um, um, a, a, a inclusive design for COVID vaccination clinic where everybody six months and older, everybody gets this menu um, to be able to pick you know, uh, um, drive up in your car or an outdoor slot. In the winter, they had indoor slots too. Um, they pick their furniture, they pick their lighting, they pick their sensory tools, they pick what we talk about, they pick music in the background. It's just like a totally customized experience. These are some, some pictures. That's not the slot I remember. Oh, that's the slot I remember. Um, I wanted to have a couple pictures from, from, from the outdoor uh, um, event a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm very proud. Those are my medical students learning about uh, universal design. And it, it, there's some pretty happy people getting vaccinated. We also have uh, social programs for kids and adults. Brain Club, I mentioned, going on right now. Hello, Brain Club participants. Um, and Kid Connections, which is um, um, a 
customized matchmaking. Kids age three to 17, we make custom matches based on shared interests and communication styles um, because everybody deserves to have relationships where we can show up as our true selves. That's funny. Um, anyway, um, uh, this is an example of a virtual program uh, that we held a couple months ago. We had 40 kids aged three to seven. Um, we had facilitated breakout rooms where stuffies communicated uh, together, and then they all came together for um, a, a stuffy dance party. Um, and they had um, different types of visual support um, to know what to expect. And Brain Club, as I said, um, this is our, our weekly free community uh, education program where we talk about all different kinds of everyday life stuff. Um, next week, talking about um, uh, uh, communicating access needs at work, and all different, all different topics. And we do a wide range of audiences, um, uh, trainings and consultations about becoming more neuroinclusive, um, including um, that this, this uh, and those trainings, those trainings are offered uh, free for uh, uh, Vermont healthcare providers and their practices. So um, that's that, we got plenty of time for questions. Uh oh, I'm seeing in the chat, I see the speaker, but no sound from 40 minutes ago. No, you've had sound. No. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> that was going to be completely embarrassing. Anyway. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Hauser? Dr. Miriam had to sign off and go to bed because he's in Scotland and was totally. almost midnight. All right, I don't see any questions. Um, Dr. Hauser, I wanna thank you for a um, very informative and, and, and really fascinating talk. Um, uh, it's much appreciated having you join us and, and talk from a perspective that we don't often hear. And it sounds like you're doing some pretty amazing work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.